good. All right, everybody, we're here with the great trumpet player, Jeremy Pelt, who reminded me recently that I actually did meet him a couple of times before, I think, and, and you were right. I, I do remember now, you know. Uh, Jeremy, how you doing today? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Well, I'm trying to hang in there, all things considered, you know. Sure. Last time I saw you, uh, it was it was before the pandemic, and you were playing with Vincent Herring, and uh, I think, was it Victor Jones? No, it was Lewis Hayes. Lewis Hayes. It's Lewis Hayes. Apologize. That was another gig I went to. Mm. <laughs> Lewis, mm. Lewis Hayes on drums, and you guys were slamming. And I did one interview with Vincent, so then I wanted to follow up and do one with you. I think I also saw you at Birdland doing a Charlie Parker thing. That's very possible, yeah. I've been doing those last couple of years. So tell me, uh, 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 I'm just curious about if I could ask, how old are you now? Um, on the uh, I'll be I'll be 45 this year. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. It seems like time flies, doesn't it? it absolutely does. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> Gee whiz, it's going by too fast. Man, so I don't know much about your background. A lot of the other cats, I knew about their background. I was enamored by your playing, by your fluidity, and it seemed like your language of Freddie Hubbard. Uh, can you tell everyone a little bit about how you started? Uh, well, I started in school uh, playing the trumpet at a pretty young age, and then after that, I just, uh, I always had an interest in jazz because my mother was playing it in the house. And so I listened and then once I got to high school, then there was a jazz band. And so I joined the jazz band and started just do due dil diligence and, uh, and, you know, listen to different recordings. And that got me more, that piqued my interest and, uh, then that's when I kind of was full on. Did you start you know, in a, directly after that? Did you start in a traditional sense with you know the basic classical how to play trumpet lessons at school or how? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was I was big in the classical music in general, and you know I think that's an important distinction to make because I mean there's people that say yeah I'm classically trained and this and that, um, but for me I was. Not on, I, I, as far to the extent of whatever classical classically trained means. I mean, I learned in school. Um, I didn't have any other teachers, so I mean, anything that I learned um, through, you know, elementary school on through high school and everything was in in the school system. Mm -hmm. And um, but prior to me playing jazz, I was definitely very, very much into classical music. So, I mean, I, I was probably, I would argue more on track to do something that was in that vein because it was either that, it was between that and conducting, which I also really did like. Huh. So I was studying scores and whatnot. Wow. That's impressive. That's similar to my upbringing. I started on classical clarinet and my brother was a trumpet child prodigy i never told you that uh he is mm. studying classical music at carnegie mellon university and that's where i started he's about eight years my elder uh at, at the age of 15 he became first chair in the carnegie mellon symphony honors honors symphony which which i was never able to get in that was very difficult and i have a picture mm. of him so for for a young black man i think around 1965 that was quite a, mm. a leap forward you know yeah I mean, I I I I, I could dig it. I, you know, I think one of the things that I remember vividly um, was they used to have this youth orchestra, and I really wanted to get into that youth orchestra. And I remember going two times to to an audition and being turned down, mm -hmm. and uh, me crying. <laughs> You know, my mother had to drive me back and she's just like give me the old pep talk and whatnot but uh yeah you know I, I, that it didn't sour me at all on on you know wanting to pursue 
music in general, but I do I do remember how hurt I felt. Right, I I understand that. Uh, wh- wh- where did you grow up? Los Angeles. Oh, Los Angeles. Are you from the West Coast? Mm-hmm. When we were in Pittsburgh, there was a youth symphony there too. My brother got into all that too. He was, uh... mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, he was one of the first or the first, I think. You know. And, and for those wow. who don't know what I mean, I mean black person. <laughs> <You know>? mm-hmm. <laughs> it, um, after did you have private lessons or just the, the teacher at the school? This teacher at the school, I didn't have any private lessons until I got to uh, to college. Okay, I got a little popping on my end from your audio, but I mm. hope it's going to be okay. You know, I pop, 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 pop. Hope it'll be okay. Yeah, I haven't heard anything over here. Okay. So what 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 happens next? How did you how did you evolve into jazz studies and then going on to college? Uh well, it's like I said, you know, I was listening. I listened a lot and uh I developed certainly uh developed an affinity towards it and uh after that I uh got to Berkeley, um, and, you know, kind of simultaneously, I was into film scores too. So my my whole design was to get into the school and get into the film scoring department. Um, but I also knew that I was always going to be out here trying to play. So in my mind, it was a dual kind of uh, thing, that, if not a major, but a dual kind of reality for me. It was like, okay, I'm trying to do film score. I'm also trying to be out here playing. So, I mean, I think the development of, of the playing in particular just came from the environment that I was in and, uh, and just constantly being challenged. So the, uh, did you, did you end up writing any film scores? Have you pursued that? I've done a, I've done a few documentaries. You know, it's a very hard thing to get into, and I think uh, I think those that are currently in it are usually a victim of extreme luck and 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 being fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, or else those that really go out and 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 you know pursue it to that extent. That I've been out here for this you know, 23 years pursuing being a jazz musician, you know, so I mean, it was one or the other. I've, 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 I've had a couple chances to score uh, a few things, um, you know, some documentary, nothing that is of, of uh, widespread public consumption. Um, but certainly, I hope that 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 changes. But uh, it, you know, I also do realize that, you know, there is a certain amount of work that goes into pursuing that craft and, and really trying to break in that market. And I know that I have not done that at all. Right. <laughs> so I don't blame anything, you know, I've been really focused on just my career. Yeah, one of the, I, I can attest to the fact that many things in this business are pure luck. And uh, people don't quite understand that why some people that, mm-hmm. you know, may end up not getting a break and some people get a break and that's that's just the business we're in i get that you know there, there, mm-hmm. that's another issue where there's not many black film scores i know you probably know terrence and i, I know branford marcellus just did a uh what was uh, that Paul rainy, rainy? Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. and before that we had what benny golson doing tv and quincy jones and benny was doing quite a lot and so was quincy sure right but but it's been a handful in comparison don't you think a uh, very, I would say, a thimbleful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that that's you know, but uh, but you know, here's the thing though, when you you compare it to just the amount of people that are doing scores in general, like okay, if you talk about people in Quincy Jones's era, and you you think you consider people like Henry Mancini and and those type of composers, I mean. First of all, it's just a thimble full of people that are going to get all the work in the beginning, in, in the first place. So we we could say, oh yeah, there's, there's only a handful of black folks, but in reality, there's only a handful of white folks. Because I mean, it, it wasn't a, it's it's not a type of field that is widespread where you know they've got you know 
dozens of different composers doing, you know, the scores because there's not that many, you know, scores to go around, you know. So and and once and once you had a niche and you had a sound that was identifiable, then that's what made you uh, desirable. So Henry Mancini had themes for days, you know what I mean? And so he was the it guy, and not that what that meant was that not only was he the, was he the it guy but then that also meant that you know a hundred other white composers weren't getting that job either so if a hundred other white composers weren't getting the job you know a hundred other black people weren't going to get the job so there was only one henry mancini and they all went for him quincy jones got in there there's only one quincy jones you know so i mean i you know i'm almost a little bit more forgiving in in that respect because it's that's that's an industry that is really just purely driven off of off of um just uh having that it potential it, it you know thing behind you you know what i mean so i it 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 never i never thought about the, the you know the 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 color issue in that regard and and which is funny because I mean, you could easily think about the color issue in Hollywood, which is a very big issue when we just talk about the whole umbrella of Hollywood and, you know, there's not enough, you know, people in, in post-production, there's not enough colored people, you know, but for that one sliver, that music, which is a big thing, it's 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 almost an even playing field. Right. I understand. You that. know, in terms of the competition, you know. Right. Right. I dig that. I, I was curious on the same topic before we move on. Did you see that movie called The Black Godfather on Clarence Evant on, on Netflix? Absolutely. Yeah, man, that was great. I I never knew about it until I watched that uh th that documentary. And I did not either, though my brother had heard of him, you know, he, he, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, that just was that was deep, wasn't it? It was. It was great. It was great. That's that's an amazing aspect of the music business that many of us don't know about, you know. Mm -hmm. So now what, what I really want to get to, because uh, you may be one of my first trumpet interviewees. I just started this like most people did during the COVID time. And I, mm -hmm. I, I want to get into how you practice, who were your teachers, were you transcribing? Uh, you do have this great facility, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I know a lot of people want to want to figure out how they can achieve that kind of goal. Mm. Well, which question shall I answer first? Well, let's start. You got, you got to Berkeley. Uh, who were your teachers? Yeah. How many hours were you practicing? Who was in the school at the time when you were in Berkeley? So when I got to Berkeley, I don't necessarily remember who the kind of the it people is. is that, I keep saying it. I got to think of a better thing. But who, who were the, I guess, the stars of, you know, the trumpet were at that point, you know? think Berkeley, what was what was interesting about Berkeley is that everything came in waves. So for instance, when I got there, the people that the, the person that had all the electricity was TL Jose Avery. He had just got signed to GRP, uh, which was just starting back up and they had this young lines component. And so he was he was like the new it guy. So they, I remember that in New York, they had this big search and they, they found Teodros and then they wanted his whole band. And so I remember that, that kind of hysteria. Um, but there was nobody like that for trumpet in the area that was around my age um, that I, I, I recall. Um, as far as teachers were concerned, my first teacher was, uh, was a man named Ray Katwika. And um, he was he, he was a lit uh, what we call a legit player, um, who taught me uh, you know some 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 basics that I really need, you know because again I'm telling you I didn't have any lessons when I was in trumpet you know I I, took, I I consider myself to be a natural trumpet player I always have, and by that definition I meant that it's it, I'm somebody that I took to it very naturally. So anything that I had um, prior to me studying was just a natural thing. But it didn't. But also, what that meant was that there was a lot of holes, a lot of deficiencies that I didn't have because I just didn't have those lessons. So he was one of the first teachers that says, "Okay, 
I want you to try this breathing exercise and, and really relate to me in terms of air and how to use air and, and play the horn and everything. And then I had him for, actually, he was my second teacher. My first teacher who was assigned to me was a man named Jeff Stout, who's still there. Um, he used to play with Woody Herman and uh, he's, he's uh, yeah, he's still there. Um, he was the first teacher I had and he had me transcribing. And that was, a, and the funny thing was that that was the first time that I uh, realized that that's what it was because in hindsight being 2020, when I was in high school and just learning, discovering jazz, you know, I got Miles Davis playing on Green Dolphin Street in the 58 sessions and I just loved the song. And so I just mimicked it and played his solo, you know, and that was transcription, but I didn't know what that was at the time. So studying with Jeff Stout, I mean, he, he assigned me some solos and I probably had a little bit of pushback at that point because now it was something that was assigned, <laughs> which was just stupid, you know. Um, and, but, you know, he was like, yeah, check out this Chet Baker solo on Long Ago and Far Away. I'm like, well, I will check that out. You know, I was, I was, that was a different Jeremy. Um, but then after him, and I had him for about two semesters and then that's when I went to Reagan Tweaker because I did realize that I needed to, to understand more about the trumpet. And I, I maybe had him for about two semesters before I went to, I think one of my most uh, important teachers, Charlie Lewis, um, mm -hmm. who I studied with him just before he got to Berkeley. So he was uh, at Boston University and there was, I'd have to mention my friend Jerome Austin, who was only about two or three years older than me. He was a, a master's student, um, classical, I think either at Boston University or any one of the, the colleges in the area. But he was a big jazz fan, kind of followed went around all the time. Um, but he he, didn't, he wasn't an improviser; he just straight classical. But he, you know, I met him at some point, and we always hung out, and we'd get together. And he, he and he'd be like, "Yo, man, you just check out this mouthpiece." And you know, he got me started on. I played the same mouthpiece, same size mouthpiece, for you know almost thirty years at this point. <laughs> you know, because you know, um, but he was always somebody that I always hung out with, and he showed me like different you know ways of playing the trump, you know, the trumpet. Um, so this and then, was, so and he must have been the late nineties. This is the this is the early this is the mid nineties. The mid nineties. Yeah. Mid nineties. Yeah. yeah and then I and then I and then I went and uh he, he's the one that suggested I get with Charlie Lewis. And then I found him at, at Boston University. I took a lesson with him and uh and it was great. Right. Um and then luckily, because those lessons were not uh free or cheap, uh he was he they, they got him at Berkeley. That's my right. last semester, right? Oh, my last two semesters, and I had switched my major. So here's the thing: if you were to, to, if anybody wanted to wanted to do some kind of research on on what I actually graduated, I tell everybody I went to Berkeley for film scoring because I did, and I pretty much, for all intents and purposes, took all the classes except for the last, the final project. And because they wanted me to stay because my GPA wasn't quite as high as I needed it to be to graduate in that major. And they wanted me to take some courses over again. And I didn't feel like doing that because I was ready to get the hell out of there. I, I spoke to a different major called professional music. And they said, and basically professional music was just like potluck. It was just like, you could just take a little bit of this major, do this and dump them in, in, in this funnel. And so when I did that with all the courses I took, that boosted my GPA, and that's why I was able to graduate on time. But I I did so with a professional music degree, and part of that was that I was able to just keep, fill, keep right. filling my basket with electives. No, I can. In which case, in which case I was able to take extra lessons, and so I started studying with Charlie Lewis, and that really got my my trumpet playing together. So you have a William Patterson shirt on. Did you get a Did you get a master's degree after that? No, I teach there. You teach there? See, yeah. I didn't know that either. I like that school. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a lot of good folks there. Yeah. So how did how did you get that? How did you get that? Are you a, are you associate professor? Tell me about teaching at William Patterson. Let's move on. To... 
Uh, well, I started in 2016. I was brought on by Bill Charlotte after their uh, previous professor had uh, left. And so that's pretty much how that's been. Uh, you know, um, I guess what you would call an adjunct uh, associate professor. Right. Uh, I guess that basically just means that I'm not full time over there, but I am the only trumpet professor in jazz there. So if you come in there, you're studying with me, you know, a lot, a lot of folks watching the music entry don't know how hard it is to get a teaching job at a university. And it's difficult Mm -hmm. because performance has been dropping off for years. The number of, in other words, for people who don't know how many times you might get a gig a week at, you know, what? When, when I first got around New York in the late 80s, I remember meeting uh, older cats who told me they used to work seven nights a week, you know, and union mm-hmm. gigs, too. Plus, they had the club mm-hmm. date. There were the union and the pension. There was a recording mm-hmm. industry. I, I remember I met a lot of those guys who used to do the studio work. All mm-hmm. all of that has died and, and gone away, you know. Right, right, and, right. And so what, what no, happened I'm, I'm, was I'm... a lot of people funneled in to get teaching jobs, right? You know. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I would look, I, I consider myself, uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very happy that that I've got it, especially when I did. And, you know, and I, and I really do love teaching there. So. Yeah, it's a great place, man. There's a, cause I can't, I can't, is Bruce Williams teaching there still? Bruce Williams. Saxon's not play. teaching there. So, oh, yeah, Bru- Bruce, Bruce is uh, a he, Juilliard now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's we got Vincent Herring over there. That's right. That's right. Okay. Vincent Herring, Rich Perry. Um, I'm trying to think. There's, I mean, they got. I'm only. I'm the only trumpet player, but they've got several saxophone teachers. One <laughs> trombone, so I know John Mosca teaching trombone. Oh yeah. Uh, but they. I think one thing they have the most is saxophones and pianos. So that therefore they have a lot of piano teachers, a lot of saxophone teachers. That's a good roster, but that that's good for you because then you get you get more students. <laughs> well, uh, I mean that 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 would be what it is if they're you know now this COVID thing has kind of knocked everything yeah. out of out of uh, you know because now students are having to defer uh, you know acceptance and you know all this and all that so right so I want to get in I want to get back into the in, into this this idea were you Trent. Mm-hmm. To me, it sounds like you're heavily influenced by Freddie Hubbard, or at least you spent a lot of time with Freddie Hubbard. <laughs> it sounds like to me. Did you write down his solos? Did you transcribe solos? What's your method for people who want to, you know? The funny thing is people always think that I did. I only transcribed one Freddie Hubbard solo. Hmm. That was it. I, um, and that's not to say, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to sit over here and say that I didn't check out Freddie. I mean, check, Freddie is obviously a very, very huge influence on me. You know what I mean? So, I mean, anything that you hear is a result of me listening to him a lot. <laughs> but in terms of the work that I did with him, I only transcribed one. So for me, the, the people that I transcribed the most of in my formative years was Lee Morgan and Booker Little exclusively those are the only you know I, you know i might have done you know one or two kenny dorham solos and whatnot but i mean in terms of like all the time it was always lee and it was definitely always booker um so that's what it was but i mean certainly you know freddie was somebody that i gravitated towards and and i knew you know so yeah that's, that's interesting to me. Uh, Lee Morgan had <clears throat> Lee Morgan had that great time feel, and then, you know, and he was mm-hmm. quite young when he was playing that way in, in a big band. I can't remember which big band, mm-hmm. Dizzy Gillespie's band, I think. And Dizzy Gillespie, yeah. He had an extraordinary time feel. I, I know even some mm-hmm. saxophone players told me that if I wanted to get my time together, I should transcribe Lee Morgan. You know, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? And the way yeah, he would do those, yeah. those triplets and the time, you know, just remarkable. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember watching that movie. I'm sure you watched that movie. Uh, what? I called him Morgan. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that was a, it. Was always something to see, you know. Did you know Charlie Persip? Absolutely. Did you play yeah. in the big band at any time with him? I I I did one. I said one rehearsal. I but I never was in the big band. But I knew Charlie. I was friendly with Charlie. 
friendly. I'm definitely friendly with Paul West. Uh, and you know the people that were in the big band, Dizzy's big band Whitley, you know. Right. So you know, I got an earful of stories from them. Certainly. Yeah, I was I was in Precip's band for a while. Actually, used to have those rehearsals down in Harlem. You remember at the mm-hmm. boys' school and stuff. At the boys' school, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's interesting to me. Let Let's move on now. You're out of school. Mm-hmm. Did you play in any big bands at all? Did you get Did you get to move right to the small group? No, absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I consider it a light of passage before you get to the small groups. Uh, I did a few big bands um, of note. I mean, one of the the, the, the big bands that I got into uh, that that Derek Gardner got me into was Frank Foster's Lab Minority. So I was playing with Frank Foster for a few years. I recorded with the big band too. So that was a highlight of my career, um, playing with Foss and, you know, going on, on those gigs and sometimes doing those jazz cruises with him. Uh, and then, of course, the Mingus band, famously. Um, I, I did that for a, a long time, you know. Right. So those those bands in particular, I, I, and I and you know when I first started doing the Mingus band, that's when I met Bird, what, what we call Bird Earl Gardner, um, mm-hmm. who I'm, I know you know, and um, and he was very instrumental in you know kind of pointing me in the direction. So he was he he was the one that 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 uh, was responsible for having me sub in the in the Village Vanguard Orchestra whenever they needed a sub. So I would do that too. So I I got a little bit of Foss, you know, a little bit of Mingus, a little bit of Thad Jones and Mel Lewis, you know. So. That's great, man. It, it was Frank Foster who hired me to sub first in the Basie band, and then I was, I played in this loud minority band for a little bit. You know. so, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. No, that, was, I, that was a fun band. I I think a lot of us learn a lot playing in the big bands, and I, I find playing yeah. with the elders like that. Is, is, is a type of schooling that, that the young people I find coming out of college just don't have at that, that, that experience of knowledge, you, you know, for instance, I did a, a yeah. thing with Bob Mentor and he talked about how Buddy Rich told him, you remember everyone was in the post coal train when Mentor was coming up, mm-hmm. Buddy told him, you know, you got that, but you really need to go back and listen to Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster and Lester Young, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it, it, it's something that I was uh, I was just having a conversation um, yesterday. As a matter of fact, I did another interview, and uh, you know, I was just saying that those those kind of opportunities with 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 things that I was preparing myself for in college, and I and I'm not ashamed, or I don't feel any type of way about saying that I was actually very prepared when I moved to New York to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, playing with Foss, you know, when the opportunity did present itself, I mean, I was very familiar with his body of work and of course the Basie band and, um, and he wrote some new charts, even when we were in the band, he actually wrote a chart to feature me, you know, which was, which was beautiful, you know, cause he liked the way I would play on these ballads. So I, anytime there would be a, a trumpet feature, he had me do it, you know. Um, and then he wrote a song that he dedicated to to Joe Newman, and it featured two trumpets: me and the other cat. Um, it'll come back to me, but yeah, you know. So that was that was fun. Um, and then of course, Mingus band was. It was uh, I checked out a lot of Mingus when I was in high school and in uh, and in college. So I mean, just being able to play those. Uh, was 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 a treat and also you know because every week was also a different round of musicians sometimes <laughs> i mean some people would be there all the time right. there were people that were there all the time john Subblefield was there all the time you know boris or actually even before boris it was like andy mckee and you know those right. the, those people that were staples in the band but you know even more so i mean it would be you know i'd show up and there would be vincent that's where i met vincent Herring. Right. You know, John Hicks would be on piano a lot of times, so that's when I got a chance to meet and play with John. Um, yeah, so Sipiagin was was Alice Sipiagin was there in the trumpet section and Bird. Um, 
you that, know, that, Ronnie Cuba. So, you know, I, I got a chance to be with all those guys. That man was always a heavy hitter. I, I got some noise coming out of here.